the path on which I walk And you know me better Than I know myself And you've known me longer Than anyone Knowledge is too wonderful for me And I can't even understand it Such knowledge is too wonderful Oh, 
you know me better than I know myself, and you've known me longer than anyone else. Such knowledge is too wonderful. Understand it. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I can't even comprehend it. But I know. the depths where I could make my bed But I never
attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. So words of power that can never fail, let their truth prevail over unbelief. Speak, O oh Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us and true sun change from the dawn of time let them echo down through eternity and by grace will stand on your promises and by faith with us so speak oh lord tell your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory heavenly father thank you for today lord right now our world's just our country's just in dire straits so father we come to you um concerned for our our nation uh, for the people lord we lift up right now your church to you that we could be a beacon of light father work massively during this time bring out truth in here um, father as we worship you help us to be the light of the world that you send out that is shining because jesus is saved so father right now let this time be worthy of you let us worship you in truth and in spirit the way that you have always intended us to so father i thank you it's in your son's name i pray amen all right well we're doing some holy waves so turn around wave at someone yeah a couple weeks of this so Get over there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. So just to let you know, so um, Dan and Wednesday are here for the, for the first time, for their first week here. Um, so, and if you don't know who Dan and Wednesday are, they're a new youth pastor. So, um, so Dan, I told Dan, every Sunday is going to be different because you never know what's going to happen. And so I'm like, guess what? <laughs> You're in the sound booth this week. <laughs> And um, so it, literally this morning, I'm like, okay, this is what you do. <laughs> and he's, he's doing a fabulous job so far. So, um, But if he messes up, it's because Joey's up there, and he's not telling him what to do properly. <laughs> it's always Joey. <laughs> um, so it is, um, so we had a couple things. So first, birthdays. We are the family of God. We like to celebrate birthdays. You won't be here next week, so you don't get your birthday for two weeks. So just to let you know. Uh, <laughs> But does anyone else have a birthday? My birthday's tomorrow. Well, that's too bad because that's not today. That's next Sunday, so you got all oh, too bad. All right, so anyone else? Yeah. 
Um, actually, do you know we have anniversaries next? Anyone celebrating an anniversary? I was told afterwards that I was reminded that I celebrated an anniversary like two weeks ago. So, not I. She forgot too, and she wasn't in here. So there you go. So that, she didn't remind me. So whose fault really is it? Right. Oh yes, 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 yes. No, we we celebrated it. We went and to go get Chinese, right? And they were closed, like everything else in Parker. So we took Chinese to our house, and ate it in um, construction site. That's what we did for our <laughs> anniversary. So uh, we're saving up for our twentieth, which is only in four years. So, um, so yeah. So there you go. I know. Well, we've been married sixteen years. I've known, I've, I've had her longer than, or almost longer than her parents. A couple more years, and I'll have her longer. So, all right. What? Yeah, well, her dad forced me. He's like, take her. <laughs> yeah. Um, but before Jim comes up, before we do that, I would like our, gradu- our high school graduates, our eighth grade, sorry, we don't give you guys money. Uh, but um, Anthony, Annie, come on up. Um, we want to congratulate them. So they graduate. They were supposed to graduate a week ago, but because of the whole virus thing, they graduated yesterday. So congratulations. And this is just a little something that we like to do for our graduates um, to let you know that we do care about you, even though we're saying get out, right? Uh, <laughs> Right. We're, yeah. We're not like your parents. Yeah. We'll say please. Yeah, you're more rude. Yeah. <laughs> um, so congratulations. Thank you for being in our youth ministry. And we, we're going to pray for you right now that God would do great things for you. Yeah. So if I could have the elders come on up, um, we're going to pray for these youngins. Okay, yeah, that's, give a better face. All right, Heavenly Father, um, I pray for these two young people that you would do great things through them, that this closing of a chapter in their lives would open up new possibilities. Father, I pray that you work through them, that they would follow you from here on out, that they would know you, and that you would provide a path for them that would um, bring glory to yourself and bring fulfillment to their lives. So, Father, I thank you for the time that they've got to be with us. I pray that we get to continue to be a part of their lives. But, Lord, as they go forward and as adults, be with them. And, Father, help us to always be praying for them. That's that in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now you have the virus, too, so go away. <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to celebrate them again tonight because... Um, and that, that's a segue. Hello. Oh, well, here we go again. This one's the black one, the, the or the wireless. I don't know what it says, black or wireless. Is it on? Hello. You know, I worked. Whoa. I worked with a guy for. Uh, Oh, maybe 15 years or so, and he said that when his um, kids turned 18, he broke their dinner plate. (laughs) And I believed him. He did. (laughs) Okay. Um, Pardon? (laughs) Do what? Uh, All right. Announcements. Uh, Tuesday, tops meet over in the fellowship hall at 7 to 9 a.m. Got it right. Thursdays, no ladies quilting yet. Friday, teen rack night, 6 p.m. And again, the invitation is for any adults who want to attend. Come on out. Saturday, I'm tired of that one. Okay, Um, Jeremiah wanted me to be sure and remind you the newsletter is out in the foyer. Pick one up on your way out. Good. It's a good one this time. They've all been good, but <laughs> pick one up on your way home. Take it. Take it home. Okay. Um, 
that's about it except for the potluck tonight. And what are you going to bring? <laughs> Potato salad, okay. <laughs> Appetite. <laughs> Hot dogs and hamburgers will be cooked, okay, Completely. provided. So that's about the size of it. Anybody have any questions you want to bring up? No, but can I Yes, you can. Yay. That means she can whoop you. <laughs> he doesn't need it. Yeah. He's a good boy, isn't he? <laughs> yes. Now I want to be tested. <laughs> I'm going to go get tested just for that. <laughs> okay. All right. That's, we better pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your love. Father, we thank you for your great and wonderful mercies. Thank you for protecting each and every one of us from this uh, flu that's going around. Continue that protection, Lord. We ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Father, we do thank you for your love, your mercies. <clears throat> Father, we would ask you now in... Uh, a great earnestness for our nation. Father, we ask you to heal this nation from its the malady that is kind of taken over. And uh, Father, you have the ability to stir things or to take things into hand and um, bring about a good result. And Father, we ask you to do that and uh, watch over our president and uh, continue to bless him and keep him safe. Watch over all our troops. And uh, Father, now as we get into the rest of this service, we just ask that you would bless the pastor, open his heart, and uh, teach us new and wonderful things, and uh, open our hearts, Lord, that we can receive them with thanksgiving. Thank you for your mercies, your love, and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. All right, so uh, before we get into this sermon, I want to share something with you. This comes from Luke chapter 13. Um, and one of the things is during this, like our, everything that's going on in our society right now, right? We got the virus stuff that's going on, and then um, apparently that went away um, instantly because things, other things happen. Um, but I want to bring your attention to this verse in chapter 13 of Luke because I'm going to read it for you, and I just want to break it down real quick. So it says, now there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with the sacrifices, um, with the sacrifices. Okay, so there's a situation where Pilate killed some people, and he mixed their blood with some sacrifices, and it's a it was a current event. We we don't get a lot of current events in the Gospels, but this is one of those times where we get a current event that was going on, and there's actually two current events that happen here. Uh, the other one is actually of a, um, a tower called, um, so, uh, si starts with an S, okay, um, Siloam, Siloam, I always, I don't want to say Siloam because that's over there, um, but it, but 18 people died from this tower collapsing, there's two events that happened, and Jesus is asked about one of them, and this is kind of where the church finds itself right now. What is going on, right? The church is asked, what, what's, what should we do? What, what's our response should be? Well, here's Jesus' response, okay? Because this is um, where his focus is. And he says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? And he says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all, you will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do they think they were more guilty than the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. See, the thing is, is during these times of like real upset and things, 
it could get so easy to be bogged down into the moment. And we should always, as the church, seek justice and mercy. Um, Micah tells us that. that. That's what is required of God's people, is to seek justly, um, to walk humbly before God. Okay? But at the same time, are we pointing people to deal with situations, or are we pointing them back to Christ? And if we're not pointing people back to Christ, saying, yeah, this is a terrible situation. Yes, evil things are occurring. But if we don't get ourselves right with God now, we will die and we will be apart from God. And you think it's evil now. It's a lot worse in the time to come. And so we really, when people talk about this, we can engage and we can talk about justice and mercy. But if we're not pointing them, if our conversation does not swing to Jesus and talk about the hope that is in him, then we are not following the path that Jesus has set out. Because he himself was saying, look, yeah, these things are happening. But if we don't repent, or and he was telling the people, if you don't repent, then you're going to die and it's just going to be the, the same. So it doesn't matter how you die. It matters where you're going afterwards. And so that's a huge thing. Okay? So I'm not going to be speaking on, this, on the rights today because I, don't, I am not of the, the opinion that I need to speak on every single... Because if we spoke on every single thing that happens, we would never... It would always be topical. It would always be the same sermon again and again because that's the reality of our lives is bad things are happening. So... Th- the purpose of what I'm teaching you guys is to for us. What are we supposed to do? And then you and I personally have to take this stuff, apply it to our lives, and say, okay, now how do I do this in the state of chaos, right? How do I apply mercy to this situation? How do I apply justice? How do I seek to share the gospel, right? And so that's the reality. So we're not going to be covering this. If you want to have a conversation about that, I would... I have no problem having conversations. Um, Daniel found that out as I was talking to him nonstop uh, while we were driving on Friday. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I just think that he's thinking, man, I can't wait till he stops driving with me. <laughs> just be here alone. Um, and he's laughing and he's like, yeah, it's mine. <laughs> so, um, so let's get into it. You guys know what a hero's journey is? You've ever heard that? The hero's journey? Um, if you ever wrote anything, or um, uh, it's a it's a it's a literary trope, okay. Um, so when you do when you write something, you, there's different tropes. Like um, you have your, of course, you have your pro- protagonist, right? That's kind of the hero of the story, and then you have your antagonist, right? And that's kind of the villain of the story, usually. Um, and most, almost 99% of all stories have both. Right? You have a protagonist and you have an antagonist. Right? And there are tons of different ways to tell stories. But a hero's journey story is one of the most common in society, in, in all cultures. Okay? It's Bilbo Baggins. Right? If you've read The Hobbit, it's Bilbo Baggins. He starts out in Bag Inn. He just kicks up his feet. He smokes his um, Shire tobacco, uh, whatever that is. And he... He's just fine. He's enjoying life, and it's mundane. And then Gandalf shows up, right? Yes. Gandalf shows up, and all of a sudden, now his world's flipped upside down, and he has to go on a journey to go meet a dragon, right? Or it's like Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker, he's on a desert planet. He hates it. He just wants to get through. He, he looks up at the stars. He wants to go, and then... A droid shows up, and now he has to find Obi-Wan, and now he's on the Millennium Falcon, and now he's leaving Moss Eisley, and now he runs into um, space dust, and that's no moon, right? And so all these things happen to him. Now he's on his path to become a Jedi. Okay? Or it's the Pevensey kids who, um, Lucy, she's hiding from her kids, or from her brothers and sisters, and she falls through a wardrobe, and now she's in this, this magical land where she meets Mr. Tumnus, and then Aslan, the giant lion, and now she has to defeat with her, um, with her family, the White Witch, right? This is the hero's journey, where you start out with this kind of bland life, 
And then you go out, and now it's this grand adventure. And at the end of it, you're never the same, right? Bilbo returns back to a place, and he is completely different, right? Luke returns as a Jedi. And the Pevensey kids, when they get back in the second book, if you read it, they all, especially Peter, looks at himself, and he's like, I was a king in Narnia, and here I'm just a child. You know, and so your world completely changes. And sometimes I've run into Christians that they look at the Christian life and they say, isn't that what it's supposed to be? Where we are brought out of sin, right? And now we're on this grand adventure, okay? So it's this idea of being brought out of mundane life that we return back into 1 Corinthians. And so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 today. And we're going to be going through the whole chapter. Now, we're not going to hit every verse. In fact, the last part of it, we're not even going to touch because it's, it's a part of everything that we're going to be talking about. Now, what we're trying to do through these sermons, through these, these summer sermon series, is to understand the overarching ideas, right? And so we're not digging in, and I would suggest that you would read through all of these on your own. That you really get into these on your own because we're just looking at the overarching ideas. Okay, and so as we're going through this, let's kind of catch up what we're at. Um, first, we start this with the understanding that Paul writes First Corinthians with one single purpose in mind. Anyone remember what that is? Unity. unity. It's unity because the Corinthian church is going through a disunifying uh, issues. A lot of things are happening within the Corinthian church that they're that's causing these split. And so Paul's main purpose is to say, I want you to be unified. And then he starts tackling the issues. And the first issue he tackles, it takes him four chapters to do it, but it's the issue of leadership, right? It's the issue of leadership because people are saying, I follow this one, I follow this one, I follow this one. And Paul's saying, all of that is rubbish. You follow Jesus. That's who we follow. And human leaders are just there to help you on your way. But all of us serve God. And so we can't forget that. And so that's the first thing he tackles. The second issue he tackles is this idea of the authority to judge, right? A lot of times we talk about judging and we're like, we want to shy away from that because oh, I don't want to be a, a judgmental person. And that's not what Paul talks about. Instead, there are situations that are happening, and he gives two specific ones. The first one was the man having uh, sexual relations with his father's wife. The second one he gives, and that's usually the one that people focus on, but there's two. And the second one is the one where he's saying that these, there's business dealings going on, and you guys aren't judging. You, believers are having business dealings, and they're having conflict, and you're taking it to outside non-believers instead of letting the church help you through these things. And so, but the main thing that he's focusing is on this idea that believers, Christians, you have a responsibility as a church to, one, take sin seriously, and when it comes to it, make righteous judgments on it. Not to the outside, right? The church's job is not to go around and say, okay, this, you know, this person's in sin, this person's in sin. That's not the job of the church. The job in judging, the church's job in judging is only when conflicts are happening to be able to step in and say, okay, let's deal with it. Let's be serious about this. So that, and Paul's point here is so that unity can be restored, right? So it's not just, hey, um, you know, Gabe's over there and I don't like his face. And so um, I want the church to judge him, right? You know, and that's not, <laughs> and that's, that's not what we're talking about. It's serious things, right? It's serious conflict that's causing disunity. Because just because one of us sins does not mean the, ju the church needs to judge. Because if that person sins, and they're, but they're seeking God's forgiveness or seeking to be washed by God, that's nothing. Because that's them being, we're all there, right? But it's, in this case, in the cases that Paul gives us, it's flagrant sin and the acceptance of that sin. 
right? So we covered all that in the first couple of weeks. And last week, we really pushed into this thing of understanding what Paul was talking about sin. And the reason why, the big reason why, he focuses a lot on sexual sin. And now he's kind of going to go a little in a different direction, but on that same kind of idea. The reason why we needed to understand that is because a lot of people will take the verses about like homosexuality that's in there that we covered, I hope, pretty good for us to understand. And they take that and they just leave it there or the, and they try to f- like finagle it to make one point or another. But in the context, we understand that, and we'll see this, that Paul's putting us into a right understanding of sexuality all right, through these, these chapters. And so that's where we find ourselves as we get into this next one where Paul is going to address another issue that's happening in the Corinthian church, okay? So we're going to be chapter 7, and we're going to start in verse 1, but we're going to be jumping around this. And the reason why is because the way Paul writes, he he writes something, and then he'll go on to another idea, and then he'll come back to an idea, and then he goes to another idea. And so what we're going to do is kind of bring it together. The parts that he talks, we're going to bring those verses together to make it a little easier on ourselves. Is that okay? Okay. Well, if it's not too bad, that's what we're doing. All right, so here we go. We're going to read, starting in verse 1, chapter 7, we're going to go through verse 6. It says, Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man to not marry. Now, I want to, uh, not to marry. I want to stop right there. In my translation, there's no quotations there. It's a semicolon. But he's actually quoting them. Okay? So he's saying, Now, for the matters you wrote about, and then he, that next sentence is, it is good for a man not to marry. Okay, so that's the subject that he's addressing. Okay, I just want us to make that clear. So, he says, it is not for, good to, uh, for a man to be married. He says, but since there is so much immorality, so now he, this is him talking, or him writing, but since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband, The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. So as we're starting this, um, now, if this makes you uncomfortable, talking about sex makes you uncomfortable, I am sorry, okay? Um, it doesn't make me uncomfortable, right? And the teens know this. Like, when I talk with the teens, they're, they, they're like, okay, maybe we're going a little too far, okay? Because I'm, I'm willing to talk, and so we're going to be talking about some issues about sex. And the reason why is because I think we all understand it's a pretty big deal, right? Especially in our society, sex sells, right? So we need to talk about and I'll tell you right now, blame the Bible, not me. All right? So, he starts off with this understanding where they're asking him. So they have, remember, if you remember at the very beginning of this, we talked about how this is not the, it's called 1 Corinthians, but it's not the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. This is actually the second letter he wrote. And that makes it confusing because we have First and Second Sec. Corinthians, and it's actually we have a first one, and then this is second, and then the third, right? So in between the first letter that he wrote and the letter we're reading right now, the Corinthian church had sent him a letter and, sa- and asked him about this, this issue. And the issue is, again, in verse 1, it is, good for a man, um, it is good for a man not to marry, okay? And so they sent him that, saying, basically, Paul, can you talk about this? But what's interesting is, why are we just now learning about this in the seventh chapter? Right? If this was an issue that the Corinthians wanted answered, why is Paul waiting so long to address it? Shouldn't that be right out of the gate? Like, I don't know if you've ever written a letter to someone, but when someone writes me a letter, I address what they say first, and then I write what I want to talk to them, right? So if they're like, hey, how's your how's life? I don't tell them about a bunch of different things that from their life, I don't go, well, what's, what's your life? I tell them what, I answer their questions, and then I move on, right? But Paul doesn't do that. So the question is, why? Well, the answer must be, 
because there's bigger issues, right? And those issues were leadership and the authority of judging, right? He wanted them to understand that and to understand what sin is, right? The sins that he talked about before he gets into this. Because if they don't understand that, then they're missing something. They're missing bigger issues in their lives. But Paul starts going into it and starts addressing it. So what does he say? He talks about immorality, right? He says, this is all about immorality. So how, how can we stop immorality? That's his focus. And he, he says, he says, the husband, he says, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise to her husband. I love this understanding because um, a lot of times we, I've had counseling sessions with people where like the, the couple's at odds with each other because there's a sense that I am my own person and they're their own person, right? And the Bible doesn't put this forth, forth in marriage. In marriage, when you have come together, guess what? You are not your own, right? You are theirs. So I always talk about Marika owns me. Like, I can't do anything without her approval, right? I, I mean, there's a lot of things I can do without her approval, obviously. But if I'm going to make a decision or do anything, I need to... Run it by her. She is my partner. And she deserves everything from me. So whatever I am, she deserves. Right? And that's one of the big things about when we're talking about these ideas of sexual immorality, why it's such a heinous thing for someone to go outside of marriage for sexual pleasure because they're not their own. Right? It's like, um, I don't know if you've ever... It's like watching a baseball game, right? You're watching a baseball game, and you have this team. And so let's say it's the, it's the World Series. You have these two teams going. And on one side of it is uh, one of my favorite players is Ken Griffey Jr., right? He's long retired. But let's say that Ken Griffey Jr. was playing on the other side. He was playing for Seattle at the time. Let's say he's playing for Seattle. And he... It's Seattle versus my favorite team, which is the Dodgers, okay? So it's the Dodgers versus Seattle, and King Griffin Jr. is on the other side. What if he came over to the Dodgers' side and started playing for them? Well, that's wrong, right? I mean, that's obviously wrong. Why? Because, because he is their player, right? He's on their team. And so it's the same in marriage, right? It's, I am on this team, and this is the only team I play for, right? And so Paul's going into this understanding of, look, husbands, wives, sex is a thing that you are supposed to do only with that person, right? It's only with this. And Paul is actually, so um, Paul is basically saying, and we can get this from, remember last week we went through all those words, that word study? The importance of that is so that when we get here, we can understand what Paul's saying. He's talking about sexual immorality. So that means no um, flings, no um, side chicks, no, you know, just flirting. There's um, no pornography because we talked about how that word is the root word for our modern word of pornography. So that stuff, none of that can be a part of our lives, right? Because it's sexual immorality. And then Paul says, look, because one of the big things that occurs with sexuality is this idea that it is a primal thing, right? It is a primal idea. And so when Paul's talking about this, is he's really making the point that it's a good thing, that sex is a good thing. And we can actually get this through Scripture, right? Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Who provides the first marriage in Genesis 2? Who provides that? God. It's God. God brings the men, brings the woman together, and then he tells them, be fruitful and multiply. You, if you don't understand what that means, <laughs> okay, then we got a problem. That means, husband and wife, go and have sexual relations. Go and fill the earth. That's a lot of sexual relations to fill the earth, right? And God's saying this is a good thing. That the, the one man comes together, and that's what we actually see here, right? Paul is agreeing with Scripture here. It's a consistent thing. 
So we have Paul saying, and he says it like this, it is good for a man, or no, this, but since there is so much more, each man, each man, that's a singular thing, right? Each man should have his own wife. That's another singular thing. And so Paul's reiterating the biblical principle of sex in marriage is good, and he's giving what marriage is, which is between one man and one woman, right? And so he's giving this. And it's not just he's going into the Old Testament and saying, okay, I'm going to get things from the Old Testament, but Jesus himself talks about this. So if, if you have it, Matthew 19, I'm just going to read this real quick. Matthew 19, um, if I can switch over to it fast enough. What was it? 19, 4 through 6. This is what Jesus says. He's asked about divorce. And Jesus responds with, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator, right? And this is going back to Genesis 2. The Creator made them male and female. So again, Jesus is agreeing with Scripture because he's the one that spoke it, right? Um, that the marriage is between a male and a female. So he's agreeing with that. And then he says, And said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two of them will come, become one flesh. That's another one of those word, ways of saying they had sexual relations. Okay? Therefore what God joined together, let, not, let a man not separate. And so Paul's going back and saying, Okay, so he's telling the Corinthians, Look, marriage... What is it? Marriage is between one man, one woman, right? And he says, and sex in that marriage is a good thing. And that's the only place it's supposed to be. Any other type of sexual immorality cannot happen. He says it's only in this one relationship. So that means, can we have sex if we're single? No. Biblically speaking, we cannot. And the reason why is because it's not in that marriage relationship. And Paul's saying very directly that that's what it is because he's actually going to, we'll talk about singleness eventually. But so, and then he talks about, then he says, I'm going to give you kind of a, a little time not to have sex. And that time is when both of you, it's a mutual agreement to not have sex. And why? For the specific reason of prayer. Is if both of you say, yeah, we're going to abstain from this for a time. So it has to be mutual and for a short time. And then right afterwards, it has to be, as he says, come back together. That's one of those other biblical words that says go back and have sex. Okay? Now, there's a reason why this is being talked about. Because in a lot of cultures, and we actually see it today, the idea of abstaining from sex is like this idea that if I abstain from sex, I'm more holy. Right? Because the idea of sex is one of those primal things, right? It's a, a primal, natural thing. And the idea is, if I want to become more spiritual, more of the supernatural, then I have to have less of the, the natural. But we don't see that in Scripture. God is the one that ordained this. He's the one that started this. And so it is a good thing. And it, it can be a spiritual thing as well, because when two people come together they are one flesh this is the marriage relationship is the the best example of who god is of the trinity it's the best example that god has given us because how can two become one well how can three be one it's the same question and the mar once you go through that when you understand that through marriage you start to understand okay i can I, because I can, with, with Marika, I can, I know what she's going to say before I even ask her, right? So I have to word my words in a way that I could get the answer I want, <laughs> right? Yeah. Don't tell her this. <laughs> but, right? I know, <laughs> this is record. She's probably listening to it in the other room. Anyways. Um, but no, it's, w because when you're going that long, and some of you that are, our, I just someone just celebrated their 45th anniversary. One of our um, our church family members celebrated their 45th anniversary today. Um, they're back home, I believe. Um, 45 years, 
For those of you who've been married any length of time, you know what a year is like, right? <laughs> 45 years of that, right? You start understanding who that person is. You know, and a lot of older people, they don't talk to each other. You know why? Because they already know what's going to happen. <laughs> they already had that conversation, <laughs> and so they know the answer to it, right? But, um, but the understanding is, you start to understand better the, who God is through marriage, right? You can start understanding that. Now, you can also understand why, you know, there's conflict, too, because there's marriage, right? So you understand sin better, too, right? Because that person's a sinner. You're fine, but that person is, <laughs> right? Um, and so just this understanding. But then he goes on into verse 10. He says, to the married. So he's specifically talking to the married. He says, to the married, I give you this command. Now, one of the things we have to understand, let's stop right there. Most of this is he's talking to believers, right? He's talking to believers. He will transition to believers and unbelievers in a minute. But right now, all this is to believers, okay? So believers in marriage to believers, okay? Okay. Verse 10, to the married I give this command. Now, I want us to be see this. It says, not I, but the Lord. This is a very specific, he says this twice. You know, well, he says it once, and then he reverses it a second, and the second time he says this. But we need to notice that he says this. He's saying, this isn't coming from me. This is a, a command from God. He's specifically making that distinction, so later on, um, we can, we'll make a different distinction. So he says, to the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. So he's saying, this is directly from God. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or, or else be reconciled to her husband. Okay, so there we go. This is a believer marriage, right? Talking about believer's marriage because he's actually going to talk about unbelieving in here as well. But he talks about that. I love how he talks about this. Um, he actually gives them a way out. See, this is another reason I said it last week why I don't think Paul's a misogynist. Because he gives, he gives a lot more leeway to women than he does with men. Because look at the next sentence. And a husband must not divorce his wife. Do you see that? No, but we can. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Paul's like, women, you got it a little easier than men. To, men, <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> right? I find that very interesting. We're not going to go into a, a, a big thing about divorce and everything, but I just find these, these things interesting. But then he says in verse 12, To the rest... I say this. So he's saying, so this is the married believers, and he says, to the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. Now, this is really interesting because previously we talked about judging, righteous judgment, right? Being able to make these righteous judgments. And here's Paul going to give a biblically uh, based uh, reasons, okay? He says this, to the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. So he's saying, this isn't a direct command. He's saying, but this is a judgment that I'm making, um, being a biblical mind because he's remember remember where is where what does god want he wants one man woman woman to come together to live together to you know basically live their lives together right for their whole lives to consummate their marriage okay all these things and he's talked about all this and now he says the rest of you if uh, any brother now who is that that's a believer right if any brother some translations um will We'll add things like sister and things like that. But in this case, he says, um, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer, okay, so this is a, a man who came to Christ who is married to an unbeliever, okay, or who still is an unbeliever, okay? He says, and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Because one of the ideas that was going around with the Corinthians is, I need to get rid of this, right? This is a, as Jesus says, I'm unequally yoked. I'm not with another believer. And so in the Corinthian church, they were asking, should I divorce my unbeliever, a believing wife? And Paul says, if any believer has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. So the unbelieving spouse, and, and he goes on, and if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. This is that situation where you come together, and I find this really interesting, and I'd love um, if you take some time and really dive into these ideas because we don't have time right now. But 
Paul's talking about this situation where you, someone has come to Christ, right? A, a woman or a man, they've come to Christ, and they're in a relationship with a non-believing spouse. And they're asking the question, should I end this relationship, right? And Paul says, uh, this is almost like a suggestion, right? Because he says, not, not the Lord, but I. He's making a biblical suggestion here. And he's saying, if they're willing to stay with you, stay with them. Okay? And he goes on to say, um, he talks about, um, let me see, in verse 16 down here, um, or verse 16, a believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. Talking about this. Um, Sorry, verse 14. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. And he says, otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. And then he says, but if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And so the idea was, the believers are like, well, I should probably end this relationship. And, and Paul goes, how do you know that that relationship is not going to lead to their salvation? Wouldn't that be great, right? To have that situation, to have that spouse come to Christ. And so he's saying, if they're willing to be with you, God's going to do something there. God's working. So stick with them. Be with them. And I'll tell you right now, I had a lot of um, people that are in this situation, and it's hard. It's really hard. And I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, right? It's hard to go through it. And sometimes it doesn't work out. But what does Paul say? He says, if they have to leave, you let them go. If, they're, if they don't want to be there, you let them go, Right? And so it's a, a real hard thing that Paul is dealing with here. But he's saying we want, what do we want, right? Paul, this is the same thing. It's unity, right? We want to be unified both in our, our church and in our marriages, okay? And so he goes into this whole thing about what's going on. And so, how, yeah, so he ends with how do you know? How do you know? And so go to your spouse believer to an unbeliever and says, are you willing to keep going with me even though I follow Christ? And if they're like, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with you. Okay. God's going to do something. If they say no, that's, that's, that's going to be a hard thing. And Paul says, maybe you, you let him go. Right? Um, now, this isn't an extension, an uh, extensive talk on divorce and or anything like that, but these are just what we're talking about in these chapters. Okay? So, now, now that we've talked about marriage, right? We talked about the marriage. Let's talk about singleness, right? Because that's the next thing. Because Paul, I, I love the fact that Paul talks about both marriage and singleness because a lot of times, even in our culture, it was a modern culture, right? Um, we, it's almost like people look down on people being single. And Paul really, he goes in to address this because the idea is, why, why are you single? What's wrong with you, right? You're an old maid or you're, you know, these, these terms that get thrown around. And it's, always, it's more derogatory to women because a, a man is like a, what is it called? A swinging bachelor or whatever it's called. Right. You know, but so let's go into singleness. So Paul says, so we're going to go back, verse 7. Paul says, I wish that all men were as I am. So this is, again, his desire, okay, his desire. I wish that all men were as I am, and, he's, and that word men can be used of women too, so he just wishes, I wish everyone was like me. He says, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, and another has that. Now, to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. Okay, so he's saying, it's good, it's good to stay unmarried. And he tells, but if they cannot control themselves, again, this is that sexual immorality he's still talking about, right? He says, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, right? 
And this is, if you're in a relationship and you can't control yourself, well, what's stopping you? I love, I love people that wait for a really long time to get married. <coughs> I'm not saying any names in here. But, um, uh, but I think it's really funny because, you know what, as soon, like for me and Marika, as soon as I slipped that engagement ring on, it was like, I'm ready. I'm ready for that coupling. <laughs> I'm ready to, to, yeah. And it was really hard. We waited 10 months before we got married. That was like an eternity, right? Because it's, yeah. And so I always tell people, if you're going to get married, get married. As soon as that, ring go, that, that engagement ring goes on, six months. Don't, any, no longer than that. Get married, right? Yeah, that's pretty quick. Um, but, um, so yeah, so, but, and I actually sent this to one of our teenagers, this verse, because they, they were going to get married in June, right? This is Nikki. They were going to get married in June because of the virus stuff. They did their vows like a couple weeks ago. And I sent her this, where he says, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than burn with passion. I'm like, and I was encouraging. I'm like, yeah, get married. You don't have to wait for that ceremony. Go Go in front of that pastor, make your vows, and be married, right? Get that done. And so, but he's talking about this. He's saying, look, singleness is actually really good. He's like, the only reason why you shouldn't be single is if you're, if you're struggling with that, that desire for that person, he's like, just get married. And then you don't have that sexual um, temptation anymore because you're going to get that fulfilled. He's like, but then they're in the marriage category, right? And everything that applies in the marriage category applies to them, right? So don't think that he's like, yeah, just do it because now you're going to not deal with sexual temptation. That's not what he says, right? Just in that aspect. But then in the marriage thing, he's, he talks about, look, you can't be doing all these extramarital stuff, right? But that's not the end of it. Let's jump over to verse 32 because he gives a reason Okay? Paul is giving the reason why he wants people to stay single. And this is the reason. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her, aims, her aim is to be devoted to the Lord both both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in the right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So in other words, what Paul's saying is, look, the reason why I, I think it's a good idea to be single is because married people have a lot of responsibilities. And those responsibilities take them away from the work of the Lord. It's not unspiritual, right? We're not talking about unspiritualness, but rather the responsibilities, the, as he puts it, the concerns, right? And I can attest to this. When I first became a Christian, um, I didn't have a lot of people around me, but the internet was brand new, and you could talk to people online. And I had, I would stay up to like three, four in the morning just talking to people about, about Christ. Now, when I got married, I couldn't do that, right? You can't do that kind of stuff. Because now you have concerns. You've got to get to bed at certain hours because, you know, someone yells at you, right? <laughs> but then if, when you have children, now you have even more concerns, right? And this was a big thing. When we moved down here, when Marika and I moved down here, we spent probably the majority of our time either with youth or in this building because we didn't have any kids. And so we could take off time for ourselves whenever we wanted. Majority of the time we, we were um, reminiscing because Dan and Wednesday are here. And so Mariah and I were reminiscing about our first like three, four years. And Gabe probably remembers this because he was back then. We would take out the chairs every single Friday. You remember that? And we would play big games in here every single Friday. When we had kids, you know how many times we did that? Four times a year. That's what we did. And those were all-nighters. And then I guess, as I got older, they became half-nighters, <laughs> right? Be, and that's what happened. The more responsibility, yeah, the more responsibility I got with my family, 
the less time I had for ministry. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, so if you're single, hey, be single. Enjoy that time. Go work for the Lord in that time. Because when you have those other responsibilities, you can't give yourself fully to these things. And it becomes hard. And so Paul's, he's actually lifting up because in a lot of cultures, singleness is looked down upon, right? It's looked down upon. And Paul's saying, no, it's actually a great blessing because you can give yourself fully to God. You can fully to the gospel ministry. And so he goes into that. But all of this, all of this is just a way for Paul to address a deeper issue. That's one of the things I love about Paul. He gives you what you want to understand, but then he's like, I got a little bit more for you. And this comes from verse 17 through 24. So this whole thing, he's he's answered their questions, right? Because they ask, it'd be good for people not to be married, right? And Paul's like, no, that's not it. If you're married, that's good. That's a one man, one woman. That's a good time to not have sexual sin. Just make sure you're not having sexual sin, right? If you're single, that's good because now you can work for God. You don't have to. That's and if you want to get married, go get married. He's like, that's not the, that's not the problem. It's the sexual sin aspect, right? But then in the middle of this and at the end, so you can actually read that those last verses as well. They couple with this. But I'm already over time, so we're going to just focus on these last verses. 17 through 24, listen to what Paul says. Nevertheless, okay, each one should, be, uh, should retain the place in the life that, Lord, that the Lord has sign, assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I laid down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not become, not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. Similarly, he who was a freedman when he was called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers, each man as responsible um, to God should remain in the situation God called him to. You hear all that? Paul's basically saying, look, the, this is the crux of the problem. The crux of the problem is not marriage or singleness. The crux of the problem is this. We need each one of us needs to be serious about sin, right? And the commands of God. And make sure that that's it. But, wherever we find ourselves, we need to be content in that. Wherever we're at, wherever God has placed us, we need to be content in that. And so he gives a couple examples. He uses the term uncircumcised, right? Because Jews were uncircumcised. Uh, they were circumcised and the Gentiles were circumcised. And he's saying, should the Jews become uncircumcised? No. Well, one, that's really hard to do. Um, yeah. And he's saying, should the Gentiles become circumcised? And he's like, no. You find yourself where you're at. Be, work for God in that time. And then he uses the idea of slavery. He says, were you a slave? Stay there unless you can get out. And he's not like, he's not promoting slavery. He's not saying, yeah, slavery is good. He's saying, stay there unless you can get out, then get out. Right? But be content in that situation. He says, are you a freed person? Don't become a slave. Right? Don't put yourself into slavery. And he, this is his idea. So if you're, in, if you're married, he's answering their question. Don't get divorced. Right? If you can avoid it. Right? Because that's what we were talking about. But if you're single, don't get married. That's what, and so this is the crux of it. This is the, this is the overarching thing here. Is we could get so bogged down in these ideas of marriage and singleness, of divorce and all these things. And what Paul's trying to get at is this understanding of where you find yourself right now, God is going to work. Wherever that you find yourself, God is going to work. So be content in it. Because 
a lot of times we want to be the hero on the hero's journey, right? I want to be the ring bearer that can make himself invisible and gets all the treasure like Bilbo Baggins. I want to swing my lightsaber, right, and move things with the force, right? I want to be the king or queen of Narnia, right? I want that. And we think, I got to get rid of everything. But you know what's really funny? If you start looking at the biblical people, like let's say Moses, right? Moves the uh, parts of the Red Sea. That's really, that's a huge thing, right? Yeah, go to, keep reading. And there's a, a part, um, I believe it's in Exodus, I think it's like around 19 or something, um, where Moses is just, he's just making decisions. Like that's all he's doing all day. Like, would you like to just sit there all day and people bring their problems to you? That would get really boring after a while. Because right. I would go home and be like, these people are idiots. <laughs> I mean, I love people. You know, like, that's what I would do. That's mundane stuff, though, right? That's mundane stuff. David, yeah, he killed a giant. But you know what he also did? Poetry. That's pretty mundane, right? I mean, not mundane in the sense that it's not worth anything, but that's, people do that. That's an activity that's part of life. Jesus, probably the most heroic person of all time. Yeah, he fed 5,000 people. You know what he also did? Wash feet, carpentry. I mean, these, this is mundane stuff. God works in the mundane. And the thing is, is if we're, if we're looking at the world and going, I want the miraculous, you know, I want to be on the hero's journey, God's saying, I want you to do that, but I want to work where you're at. And so we need to come to this place in our lives where we're content with what we have. And we're okay with that. And we're saying, okay, God, where I find myself right now, wherever that is, what are you going to do here? And Paul uses marriage as that example. And especially that one where he says, believer to the unbeliever. If they're willing to stick with you, stick with them. Why? Because God can do something there. And so my challenge for you this week is very simple. Is to go back and read this chapter and really focus on these verses 17 through 24. Really focus on those verses. And you can couple these with the last few, uh, the verses we haven't, cha- haven't covered in this chapter. And really go through these and really, and go back and say, God, one, Worst sin in my life, right? Because that's, that's kind of the purpose here, is he's talking about sexual sin. Okay, God, am I dealing with any sin that I need to deal with, right? And secondly, in my situation, help me be content because I want to see you work. So show me how you're going to work. Are you going to work in my spouse's life? Are you going to work in my job? Are you going to work in my, you know, most of you are retired, so my retired life, right? You know, retired... It's kind of like singleness, right? You have a lot of time. Yeah. You know what that means? You've got to be sharing the gospel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, but what, what are we doing with what God has given us? And once we get that, once we understand that, then these times of like uncertainty with all this stuff going on, we can be better lights. Because when I've talked to a lot of people, And they're like, if I could just get out of this, I'll be fine. It's like, if you just turn to God, then you'll be fine. And this will become a blessing, whatever that is. Become a blessing and not a curse. Because God has placed you here for a purpose. And it might be because someone that you're going to meet needs to hear the gospel. And if you were taken out of that situation, they would not hear the gospel from you. God would still get them the gospel. I'm not saying that that's the end but God wanted to use you to be the in the hero's journey but instead you stayed at Bag End or you stayed on Tatooine or you stayed inside England All right? if you don't understand those references go read a book <laughs> right? let's pray Holy Father I thank you I thank you for your people I thank you uh, that you called us into light to be lights, to be salt and light of the earth. Father, I thank you that we get to be a part of that. But Father, as we're doing that, help us to be content, moved by your Holy Spirit into our lives so that whatever we get, that that feeling like, ah, I gotta move. 
that we first check it with you. And if you say no, then we stay and we're like, I'm going to be content. So, Father, I pray for everyone in here that you would move in their lives and do great, miraculous things through the mundaneness that they have, through that mundane living of going to work, waking up, having lunch, whatever it is, Lord, that you would work through it and people would be saved because of it. So, Father, I thank you, and it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to sing this song. And it's called Jesus, Only Jesus. And it's to get our minds directed onto Christ. the power to raise the dead who can save us from our sin he is our hope our righteousness it's Jesus only Jesus can make the blind to see who holds the keys that set us free he paid it all to bring us peace it's Jesus only Jesus and holy King Almighty saw the light and I'll wake some of you up it's kind of hot in here I'll tell you what yeah all right I won so aimlessly life filled with sin I wouldn't let my dear savior in then Jesus came like 
like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I've walked in darkness, clouds cover me. I had no idea where the way out could be. Then came the sunrise and rolled back the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like a blind man, I wandered alone. Worries and fear, I claim for my own. Then like a blind man who God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Amen. All right. All right, we got a potluck tonight, so don't bring hamburgers or hot dogs because those will be provided, but bring something that's cool, maybe a salad, macaroni salad, something like that, potato salad. That'd be great. All right, don't forget deviled eggs uh, and jelly eggs or something like that. Um, God bless you. Have a great week.